Peace. I'm Brian Musser, the Baptist Campus Minister at Drexel University, and this is Peace and Power Christian Fellowship, the peace of Jesus Christ to change your life, the power of the Holy Spirit to change the world. And we are working through a series that will be questioning kind of what Christians believe and how that connects to what we do as a fellowship or a church. So we're going to be looking at the beliefs, the essential beliefs of Christianity and how those beliefs affect how we live in the everyday world. So first of all, last week we kind of did the vision casting, the launch of this. And if you want to see that video, it is available on YouTube and um, I highly recommend it. But we looked at the idea of making disciples is the primary function of Christian fellowships. And we looked at how um, the, the great commandment works to show who a person is and how discipleship can be modeled after the person as divided up into the great commandment. Now I'll explain that a little bit as review. So here we have Matthew 22, 37 through 40. And he being Jesus said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Mark says basically the same thing, just a little bit different, because between Hebrew, which is what Jesus is quoting here, the Aramaic, which is what Jesus spoke this in, and the Greek in which Mark and Matthew wrote it, the way you divided a person up into pieces, or what it meant to be a whole person, was a little bit different in each of those languages, in, in each of those worldview idea areas. So, so Matthew and Mark divide the person a little bit differently. Mark says it this way, this is the most important, Jesus answered. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. So it's this idea of loving God with all of who we are and this idea that we break up who we are into certain pieces and then also that we love others as we love ourselves. So based on that, Dallas Willard created this lovely sort of schematic of how we can divide the person up. So, love the Lord our God with all our heart. You see, sort of in the middle at the bottom of the triangle, there's the heart, which he says is the will or the place where we make our decisions and our choices. And the easiest place where we can make our decisions and our choices is in the mind. We can choose what we think about. We can choose our thoughts. And then as we choose to think about good things that will affect our soul or our feelings and not these wishy-washy feelings like we find on Hallmark, but, but the deep feelings like joy, peace, hope, those sorts of things. But not only do we choose what we think about and that affects our feelings, but our feelings affect our ability to choose. The, the more at peace we are, the easier it will be to make good decisions. And as we make good decisions, we can think about good things and that will again affect our feelings. So that inner circle, what happening in inside of our head, in our personality, in our mind, can create a virtuous cycle that actually builds on it. Now it could create a vicious cycle where our feelings are down because we make bad choices. We think about bad things, which negatively impact our feelings, which again negatively impacts our choices. So it's not always going the right way, but it can be. And we should, as we're able to, in our discipleship experience, decide what we should think about. Use our will to control our heart and our thoughts. So 
So, and we can see that some of the things a church does where it asks people to make a commitment to Christ through preaching. So inner and outer journeys there affect the heart, discipleship or study, following after the thought life of scripture um, and teaching scripture, the inner and outer journey that engages the mind, worship, putting God in his proper place and knowing where we are fitting into the entire scheme of things um, affects the feelings or the soul and missions, inviting others into the worship of God affects their soul. Now, as our inner life starts getting more and more Christ-like, we can also use our will to engage how our body engages the world, or as um, scripture would call it, our strength. And this talks about personal care, taking care of ourselves and using our body in the world in a way to take care of others, to bless them and not harm them. And then love our neighbor as ourselves. That's our social context that can um, be summed up as fellowship among other believers and hospitality, inviting those into our section. So as we were thinking through things, that whole idea of of discipleship, of the church, of us becoming more and more Christ-like, of us making disciples revolves around this idea of these five pieces of who a person is, heart, mind, soul, body, and social context or strength and neighbor are the ways we should engage ourselves to become more Christ-like and the ways we engage the world to become more Christ-like. Now, as we move forward in this session, and actually the next several sessions, this series, we're going to be looking at how we make commitments of the mind. What do we choose to think about? What do we choose to concentrate on? How do our beliefs and our concentration on those beliefs affect our discipleship process? So looking at a couple quick verses here, Romans 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as living as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So looking at that, that phrase, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the be transformed there, that is a commitment. That is a decision. That is a choice you make. If you want to be transformed, you have to do certain actions and you have to decide that that, that is the path you're going to follow. And all of this is sort of phrased in a command. So it's something we choose to do. Now, we can talk about how the Holy Spirit equips us to make that choice. And that is very true. And that's something we should never ignore. But ultimately, it is a commitment of our heart to follow after Christ. And one of the first steps or one of the ways we do that is we renew our minds. So we make a commitment of our heart to engage our thought life, to engage our mental aspects, to think on good things to think on godly things, to learn about who Christ is, to engage the world through that mental process of studying Christ. And how do we do that? What kind of engagement is that? Philippians 4, 8 says it this way. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, if there is any praise, dwell on these things. So one of the ways we renew and transform our minds, we be transformed by the renewing of our minds, is to dwell on truth, honorable things, just things, pure things, lovely things, commendable things. So it's this idea of we're using our will to choose what we think about. And as we do that, that will help us become more and more like Christ. That's the basic idea of what we're going to be looking at over the course of the next several weeks. This term, the fall session, is we're going to look at what sorts of things do we want to think about 
What beliefs do we want to concentrate on? And how do those beliefs affect our lives? So first question here, um, and this is for discussion. If you're participating in the group, you know, drop down, hit hit some answers up in the comments section. But how can make the commitment or decision to think about good thing, think about certain things, good or bad, and not others affect the other areas or feelings through worship? I mean, dwelling on the person of Christ, Christ's sacrifice, can change our entire mood. The fact that God loved us so much that he you know, died for us, concentrating on that thing, thinking about that piece of the Christian um, belief system could drastically change how we feel. Having a proper perspective of who we are and taking care of ourselves and seeing our self-worth and our physical worth before God can have a drastic effect on how we use and choose to engage our body. And then social context, um, Seeing people, believing that people are created and loved by God should change how we love our neighbors. So good things, but bad things, you know, if, if, if we don't believe those things, if we believe that people are merely usable and expendable entities on this, uh, this earth, we're going to treat them differently. And then what are some ways to help us think about good, godly things? Um, engaging with other believers would be one of those. Studying scripture. Good worship music helps it helps us keep those those ideas in our head for an extended period of time. Um, there are ways we can concentrate reading, reading certain quality books. Um, those sorts of things help us concentrate on good godly things, and as we do that, our mind will be transformed. Now, as we're looking at these belief statements, as we're thinking about ways we engage and ways we believe things. Not all belief statements are created equal. There are certain beliefs that are more important than others, certain beliefs that are of a different level than other beliefs. And let's talk about that a little bit. There are three categories that I like to divide beliefs into. Um, absolutes, these would be beliefs that change the that change the nature of the system these beliefs define the belief system um and i'll get, explain that a little bit different uh, a little bit more uh, with examples in a, in a minute then the second one's convictions these are important beliefs that there have that they have mutually exclusive points of disagreement but those conflicting sides do not change the nature of the system so there's a right or a wrong, and it's good to be right, but not always necessary to be right to still be part of the overall belief structure. And then there's preferences. These are beliefs and at times practices that have multiple ways of doing things, but they may not be necessarily um, mutually exclusive. So let me let me highlight some exa examples here with this, and I think these three categories will explain themselves as we look through. The examples. So an absolute in the Christian belief system would be Jesus Christ rose from the dead. If you say Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, if that's the belief you're holding, you're talking about a different belief system than Christianity. Christianity is centered around this idea that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now, there might be a lot of discussion about pieces of that, but Jesus Christ rose from the dead. If you don't believe that, you've changed the belief system so much that it may no longer be that it, Christianity. So hopefully that's kind of clear. It's like, it's, there is a God would be another one of those. If you say there is no God, your belief system is necessarily different than the core of Christianity. Christianity isn't really Christianity if you don't believe that there is at least a God. Christianity isn't really Christianity if you don't center it around the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those are absolute beliefs. Those are absolutely necessary beliefs to be talking about the belief system of Christianity. Now, the next one's conviction. These are belief systems that there's a right or a wrong but being wrong doesn't exclude you from the overall belief. So 
An example in Christianity would be speaking in tongues is a spiritual gift that is currently available to Christians. The opposite of that is the belief that the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues was only available to the first generation of Christians. So those are two competing beliefs. Speaking in tongues is for today, speaking in tongues is not for today. Mutually exclusive. You can't hold both of them. There's basically very little middle ground between the two. There are some Christians, Christians, and they are still Christians, that fall on one side of that issue, that speaking in tongues is available today. There's another subset of Christians that say speaking in tongues is not available today. Those both are Christians. One of those groups is going to be right. One of those groups is going to be wrong. But they're all going to be Christians. And it's important. I, I think that belief is kind of somewhat important in how you engage the world, how you engage scripture, how you engage worship. And it would be good to be right on that. But being wrong on that doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Being wrong on that doesn't change the belief system so much that you're talking about something other than Christianity. It is an important belief. There is a right or wrong, but it still fits, even being wrong, still fits into the overarching belief system. So the last one is preferences. And the four spiritual laws is the best way to present the gospel. That's a preference. That might change over time. That might change in, in context. And you see the word best there. Sometimes these preferences talk more about best. And there might be second best third best or at this moment it would be best to do this you know um there's a lot of preferences now the question is how do these affect how we live our lives i believe that there's there's a couple of pieces here not only should we a lot of times we have a lot of christian debates and those are in the convictions but i think most of the debates we have are about what falls in the absolute categories, what falls in the conviction categories. We have a lot of arguments, I believe, about convictions as if they were absolutes. Or we treat a lot of our convictions as absolutes. And we get, we treat others as if we were fundamentally different so much that we aren't even in the same religion because we're talking about convictions and not absolutes so as you develop in your christian faith as you think about things as you try to transform by the renewing of your mind it's going to be important to look at your beliefs those things which you are going to be concentrating on and consider whether or not this is an absolute core and essential piece of christianity and how you put it in the center and what are convictions what are things that are true that you believe are right that you believe this is the right theological expression of this but it's not necessarily an absolute and then what what pieces are preferences so so sorting through your beliefs in this way will be important one for how you treat others especially other christians but two also for how you engage those who aren't christians we probably spend a lot of time trying to convince people who aren't Christians about our Christian convictions a lot sooner than we do to convince them about the absolutes of Christianity, the, the, the centerpieces of Christianity. We explain maybe some convictions so much more than we explain the, the, the absolutes. So just looking at those I, I would like i would strongly suggest you kind of work through some of those absolutes and convictions and also how you would engage folks who disagree with you in some of those areas now questions and think through what do you believe might be some absolutes convictions or preferences in christianity and how could thinking through these areas help engage others in a christ-like way if you have answers questions comments about that drop down in the comment section Lo love to hear from you um, leave me a note and i will definitely answer um, and, and comment on what you replied to me about now this one's a little bit different and we're going to go through this quickly i don't think this is as important as absolutes beliefs convictions but there's another way to group our beliefs as well that would be primary secondary tertiary 
So primary beliefs are those foundational beliefs that form the basis of the other beliefs in the system. Secondary beliefs are directly derived and dependent upon the primary beliefs, and then tertiary beliefs that are supported or tangential to the system built by the primary and secondary beliefs. I know that was that was probably a lot of word speak, um, and you might not get that, but we have examples of that as well. So, so in Christianity, um, a primary belief there is a God who created the universe as we know it. That is one of our foundational primary beliefs, and I believe that's also an absolute belief. But the secondary one would be because God created the universe, we are morally responsible to God. You see how that builds off of the primary one. Um, the secondary one, if it is true that there is a God who created the universe, that truth affects our beliefs in this way. We are morally responsible to the God. And then tertiary kind of builds off of that even more. Because God created the universe and we are morally responsible to God, then following the commands of scripture is the best way to live in a relationship with God. So, and you could even go further than that is like, you know, mentioning a particular sin, you know, not don't commit gluttony, don't, is a, because of all these things, we shouldn't be gluttons. Um, that is kind of how a tertiary belief thinks. And sometimes our absolutes could be primary, secondary, or tertiary. There are tertiary statements that were probably absolutes built on other things, but they are conclusions to other beliefs. So if we say there is no God, that knocks down a lot of the belief systems. That has implications throughout. If we say God didn't create, that has implications throughout the structure. So this idea of primary, secondary, tertiary is about, you can, you can kind of sum it up with using because or, you know, why. You know, Jesus is the only way it is a belief statement in Christianity. Why do you believe Jesus is the only way? Because scripture says so, because the church, church has taught it because Jesus seems to implicate it himself. So that's why we believe it, but there's a foundation, more foundational beliefs to that. And then why why do we believe what the church teaches, or why do we believe what scripture says, or why do we believe what Jesus taught? We believe what Jesus taught because he rose from the dead. You know, so, so you can see how you can support one, getting back to the primary one, which is probably Jesus's resurrection, because of Jesus' resurrection, we believe what Jesus is, Jesus taught, and it seems that Jesus taught he was the only way for an intimate relationship with God. Those are three different levels of belief statements. So that's kind of the, the structure for what we're talking about. We're going to look at how what we decide to think about can be a good piece of discipleship process and evaluating these belief systems. Now, next week, I will not be the one teaching. Um, Reverend Stan Williams will be. He's actually my boss, the director of student ministries for the Baptist Resource Network of Pennsylvania and South Jersey. And he's going to be talking about some interesting faith development, how as we engage young adults and grow up in maturity of age, we also change how we grow in what we think about beliefs and faith in those sorts of ways. Now, just a quick introduction. We are going to be, for the next 10 weeks or so, talking about what we believe, an exploration of the impact of the essential beliefs of Christianity uh, have on our lives. Now, those beliefs are going to be Jesus, what we believe about Jesus, what we believe about Scripture, what we believe about the Trinity, what we believe about creation, what we believe about sin, salvation, the church, and the future. So that's kind of where we'll be working through after next week. Um, Reverend Williams will be presenting something uh, uh, to us that will build on this week, and then we'll start looking through our specific belief statements as, as Christians. As always, there are three ways to join now. In person, Sunday nights at 7 p.m. in the Jimic, which is a 
3225 Arch Street in Philadelphia. We're live Monday nights via Zoom. And you'll be able to find that contact in the comments below. And these weekly wrap-ups on YouTube and or WordPress. I am all over social media, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, WordPress, and YouTube. Those links are in the description as well. I enjoyed having this conversation with you and hope to talk to you again real soon.